this afternoon I was praying about what I should do in light of not being able to preach this morning, whether I would continue to preach only a portion of the text or whether I should cover the whole text but to do a different sermon. And in meditating upon it, I decided it was the right thing to do to change the sermon in order for us to cover all of John 9 because I believe that this text is really essential for us as we consider spiritual darkness in our own lives and the light that is Christ. And I don't want to miss any of this truth. And so I have I've changed the sermon to allow us to cover the entire text, and I trust it will be a blessing to your heart as it has been to mine. Because it is a longer text, I will allow you to continue seated, but as you hear it, remember that this is the word of the Lord, the life-giving word of God. Reading from John 9. As he, that is Jesus, passed by, he saw a man blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned, or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he's like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And again, there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, for he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are the disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet you opened, he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, 
But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the beginning of the world has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Thus ends the reading of God's word. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of God abides forever. Let's pray one more time. Lord, we know that you are the light of the world, that the entrance of your words gives light and it gives understanding to the simple. We come tonight, Lord, as a needy people. We do not know, Lord, your will apart from you showing it to us in your word. We have need of it in order to live in our daily lives. We pray, Lord, that you would show us your son, Jesus Christ, and that in knowing more of him, that we would worship. Be with us now, Lord, as we study your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So this past week, as I was preparing this text, I looked out the window of our church in Sunnyvale, and I saw a blind man on the road. He was crossing the road with his son. He had these dark visors across his face. He had a pole out in front of him, and he was tapping the street as he went to make sure he didn't trip on any hazards going down the road. And it made me think, what was this man's story? What had happened to him? If he had not been born blind, then what kind of accident or disease had struck this man that brought him to this condition where he was there with what looked like his son clinging to the the son's arm and walking across this busy street. What had happened to this man? You think about the diseases or accidents that can bring blindness, and it's terrifying to think of what could cause it. Acid in someone's face. It could be blindness that comes from an injury, a wartime injury. It could be any number of causes that bring about blindness. But this causes a fundamental change in every aspect of a person's life. It's one of the most terrifying kinds of accidents we can imagine ourselves in, to be forever blind. And as I thought about him and thought about our text, I thought about how much greater is the danger of spiritual blindness. When you see a man like that, not able to see the world around him, and consider all the changes it made for him, how much more for someone who is lost in the blindness of their sin, someone who does not even know that they are blind, they don't know any other world except the world of darkness. This is the real danger in our world today, a spiritual blindness that is so gripping of a person that they don't even know that they are blind. The scripture says that every man is a sinner, that we are all lost in sin, and apart from Christ, we would have no light. And as we look at this text, I want us to see how it is that Jesus comes to us, showing us that he is, in fact, the light of the world, that he has come to bring light in the midst of darkness. The context here in chapter 9 really flows out of chapter 8, as Jesus was in the temple talking with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and in this previous chapter, then they are trying to trip him up, that they are constantly trying to attack his words in order to undercut his ministry. In chapter 8, we see that Jesus declares that he is the light of the world. 
you look in chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He tells them here with his words that he is the light of life. I believe that he's saying that the light that he is is life-giving light. It's a light that imparts life to them. And throughout all of chapter 8, we see increasingly the intensity against the ministry of Christ as over and over again the Jews rebuke him for his words and, in fact, accuse him that his father is the devil. Going from 39 and onward, then they say that he, in fact, serves the devil. And Jesus then responds to them and says that if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. And it was for the words that Christ said here that at the end of the chapter, he goes on and says, Before Abraham was, I am. A claim that put him right there with God, his father. That then they took stones up to kill him because of this saying. The Jews hated the Lord Jesus Christ. Here We see that these religious leaders assaulted him for these true sayings of Christ as being the one who is the light of the world. And at the end of chapter 8, then Jesus then escapes them. He hides himself, goes out of the temple, and then goes out into the street. And it's there that we find that he turns away from the Jews who forsook him to this poor blind man who did not seek for him. And we begin to see a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 65, where the Lord says, I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek for me. And as we open up this text, I want you to see how it is that Christ as the light himself, who is light, produces a strong reaction. It's inevitable. When that light pierces the darkness, then it will always produce a strong reaction. Either he will make you see, or he will make you blind. This chapter could be divided into two parts. Uh, the first part, from, from verse 1 to 7, is the action of Christ as the light. The action of Christ. And the remaining verses, from 8 on, is the reaction to Christ. And so we're going to look at the chapter in those two parts, the action of Christ and then the reaction to Christ. So look with me in verse 1. What is it that Christ does first? Well, the first thing is that he sees the blind man. Christ, the one who, is, the one who has come from the Father into the world to speak to the world as their Savior, escaping here from those who would seek to do him harm, he turns from all that he could look at in the world, and he sees this poor blind man beside the road. Of all the masses of people that he could see, that his love and compassion goes to this one blind man that is there, who's all his life been begging for everything that he needed for sustenance. Jesus sees the blind man. You think about how many people walked right by the blind man and didn't pay him any attention at all. He couldn't know who paid attention to him. He couldn't see anything. And yet Jesus has compassion on the man. He sees this blind man and pays attention. And there's a lesson right off from here that Jesus is one that sees you in your affliction as well. As one who's not only man, but also the son of God, he is the one he has compassion upon those who do not seek him. He's the one who sees even this blind man and has compassion upon him. He has compassion upon you and your ailments as well. But he not only sees the blind man, but he also then illumines those who are erroneous. And that's the disciples. There's the blindness of this man here sitting beside the road, but the men themselves, the disciples who are with him, also have a kind of blindness because they evidence in their questioning to Jesus that they don't have a clue about the working of God's providence in the life of this sufferer. 
In verse 2, his disciples ask him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You see how it is that they think that there's only one of two options. And at the root of that, then it is the fact that sin must have caused this blindness. This was the only reason that they could think that any man would suffer so grievously. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Some think that these men had a thought that perhaps this, they believed in the soul of the man having pre-existed the body. That perhaps he had committed a sin in a previous life. Obviously, since he was born blind, he could not have committed a sin before that, that point in this life. It had to have been from a previous life. Or it could be that his parents were the ones who sinned. As men who had not acquainted themselves with the scriptures, Ezekiel 18, that says that the soul that sins shall die, they looked at this man and they thought it had to be either he sinned or his parents sinned. This must be at the root of it. But Christ looks at them and he sees the blindness of their understanding regarding God's work in the world. And he begins immediately to correct them. In verse 3, he says, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God should be displayed in him. Now you have to think. The text doesn't directly tell us, but immediately after this, then Christ anoints the man's eyes with the mud. And I think that Christ was likely within earshot of this man here. And you think about being a blind man who all your life had been neglected, who had been overlooked, and probably bought into the same lie that these disciples believed, that his blindness was the result of some personal sin, the sin of his parents or the sin of himself. And yet here Christ comes and says that this, the affliction that he had was not because of any personal sin, but that the works of God should be displayed in him. What joy would that be for a man who hears this word, who understands that all of these falsehoods concerning this affliction are false, but that there was a purpose of God behind this affliction, that the works of God should be displayed in him. Christ here illuminates the darkness of these disciples and showing them what it is that is the true reason for God's works the work of God to display Christ's illumination as the one who is the light of the world. This is the true reason why this man is here in this condition, to display the works of God. I would ask you, friends, whatever affliction that you are going through, it is certainly true that Scripture says that there are some sins and some afflictions which are the result of a personal sin. 1 Corinthians 11 says that those who partook of the Lord's Supper unworthily, some of them even died. But yet, at the same time, affliction is something that God uses to display his work of redemption in the people's life. And the Lord often does that with his people and uses affliction as the backdrop on which he will display his grace. J.C. Ryle comments that God has thought fit to allow evil to exist in order that he may have a platform for showing his mercy, grace, and compassion. And this is what Christ tells them here. It was that the works of God be displayed in him. This is the reason why Christ has come, in fact. Verse 4, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no man can work. It was the whole purpose of why Christ had come into the world to display the works of God against the backdrop of human sin and misery. That he was here, and as long as he was in the world, before he died on the cross, he was there to work the works of him who sent me while it is day. And note here how it is that he says that we must work the works of him who sent me. The text says that, in fact, all of God's people, the disciples who are with him, are included in the mission that the Father has sent Christ. 
we must work the works of him who sent me, Jesus. He includes his own disciples in the men who will display God's works by revealing them against the backdrop of human sin. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. You, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, have the privilege and the opportunity of working alongside, underneath the Lord Jesus Christ, in that mission the Father sent him to see to it that the works of God are displayed against the backdrop of human misery, to point people who are suffering to the one who is the light of life. He includes them there with him. Night is coming when no one can work. I've been reminded very, a number of times in the recent days how short life is, that there are so many who have passed away unexpectedly in diseases that have struck people. Even this morning's incident on the road, how quickly life can change. And Christ here is challenging these men who are with him that even as Christ himself knows that the night is coming when no one can work, that as long as he was in the world, he is the light of the world. And he must work the works of him who sent him. This is the privilege and the glory of every believer in Jesus Christ to make sure that the works of God are displayed against the backdrop of human misery. So he corrects the erroneous people, but he goes on and not only corrects them, but he thirdly changes the life of this man. Verse 6, having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. As we saw in chapter 8, Jesus had thus far said with his words that he was the one who is the light of the world. But here it is that he then goes and displays his own power as that light in changing this man's life. He sends the man to the pool of Siloam with a mug on his eyes. You have to ask, why does he put mug on the man's eyes? This is counter to what we as men would believe is the thing to do. The mug only makes him more blind. Mug is something that prevents him even farther from seeing. Yet God's ways are not our ways. And God then, through the Lord Jesus, sends this man to the pool to go and to wash. I might remind you of Naaman the Syrian who went and was told by the prophet Elisha that he was to go and to wash his leprosy in the Jordan River. And Naaman was a man who was proud and would not go and wash at first because why would God send him to the River Jordan when he could send him to the cleaner rivers of the waters of Syria? But it was a test of faith And so this man here, as he hears the word of Christ, that it was not his sin, but it was that the works of God be displayed in him. Christ, the light of the world, believing in the words that he has heard of the Lord Jesus Christ, then he goes to the pool of Siloam. And note here how it is that the author, John, here points out that Siloam means sent. And why is it that he points this out? It's because in verse 3, when, in verse 4, when Jesus says that he has come to work the works of him who sent him, that Jesus is ultimately the one who is the sent one. And that as he goes and washes in the pool of Siloam, that in effect what this is showing us is that as he washes in the one who is the sent one, as he's ultimately baptized into Christ, united to the Lord Jesus Christ, that he experiences the transformation of his life. Uh, the symbolic cleansing in the waters of the pool sent are, in fact, showing us that it was the, ultimately the one who is sent of the Father who is who, the one who could give him the transformation of life. And so he went and washed, and he came back seeing. And this was amazing. This, since the beginning of the world, as we'll see in a moment, no one had ever been made able to see who had once been blind. This was a breakthrough into this new era, showing that Jesus Christ here is, in fact, the light of the world. This is the action of Christ as he has now given sight to this man 
and displayed the truth that not only in word, but in power, he is the one who can deliver not only a person from their physical blindness, but also from their spiritual blindness. The question then is, what is the reaction to Christ? And in the remaining verses, we'll look at three particular reactions to the light as it enters the world. You think about when light enters a dark place, that it could be good or it could be bad, depending on who you are and what you're doing. If you are a thief in the middle of the night and the motion sensor comes on, you're terrified. Light is something that scares you away. If you're lost in the middle of the woods and you see a light in the distance, you realize that's the direction I should go. You're thankful for that light. And it all depends who you are and what you are doing, how you react to the light, and ultimately how you react to Christ. And so the first reaction that we see to Christ is in verses 8 to 12, as we see the neighbors here reacting in shock. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is not this the man who used to sit and beg? There's this hubbub of commotion as some people are saying, yes, this is the man that used to be here and beg. And then others are saying, he cannot be. He's so totally different. I can't believe that this is the same man. And then all that while, then the man himself is continually saying, I am the man. I am the man. I am the same one. And then they ask, how were your eyes opened? And he said, I don't know. It, Jesus told me to put mud on my eyes and to go to the pool of Siloam and be washed. And I went and I received my sight. And then they say, well, where is he? And he says, I don't know. They're reacting in shock because they saw a changed life. It's inevitable that whenever someone comes in contact with the Lord Jesus Christ, that they come away with a changed life. There's a radical change at the root from one condition to the other. There's no halfway point. There's no continuum on a spectrum of someone who has met Jesus Christ. They either will react with a changed life as he changes them from the inside out, uh, or they will react and turn away from him. There is no halfway point. They see here that this man is radically different. So different, in fact, it seems that he is a new person. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And when they say to him, where is Jesus? He says, I don't know. It's because ultimately Jesus came to him. As these people are saying, where is he? That we can go to him. Now he's reminding them. Jesus came to me. I don't know where he is. He came to me first. As I was there in my blindness, sitting beside the road with no hope, Jesus came to me, and he changed me. It's the only way you will find Jesus, if, if Jesus comes to you. So the neighbors react in shock. The question is, are you a different person? Have you changed since you came to know Jesus Christ? Is there a difference in you today than there was 10 years ago, if you've known Christ that long? He doesn't leave you where he finds you. He takes you and he changes your heart and makes you a new creation. And he continues that work all of the days of your life. There's no plateau in the Christian life. For someone who is going in a plateau, in reality, they're going backward. Christ has come to change your life and those who are truly united to Jesus Christ, who are baptized into him, united to him, will be fundamentally changed. The question is, how do you know you're a changed person? What, what do the people think who you are near? What about your family members? Do they think you're a changed person? Think about when you were first converted, the friends you lost, perhaps, the churches that you left where they did not preach the gospel. Think about co-workers. Do they know that you are a Christian? A Christian leaves a changed life. There's no way to continue on in the same way. People around you will know you are different because Jesus has changed you. So the neighbors react in shock. And there is a, a clip on the computer of this man, Jordan Peterson, you may have heard, where he was asked about the gospel. 
Uh, he's a, a man who is well known in some circles as one who champions conservative values and has challenged men to be men. And many people have thought that his message was one that sounds Christian in some way. And someone asked him, you know, so what do you think of Christ? And he said, I think that Christ seems to be everything that I am imagining to be true, but yet if he's really true, that means everything's going to change. My whole life would have to change. And he could see it from a distance, as it were, but yet at this point, uh, he has not embraced Jesus Christ because he knew that if he went from believing that, yes, this is the ideal, yes, it seems like it's too good to be true, if he went from there to believing, yes, it is true, that would mean he would need to bow his knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. All of his life would change because a Christian leads a changed life. And that's what the neighbors here saw in him. The second reaction, though, is the one of the Pharisees in verses 13 to 34. As we see their reaction of antagonism, the Pharisees here bring the man before them. Their goal is to convict this man. And their pride is manifested first in how they endeavor to trap him in his words and to convict Jesus Christ of transgressing the traditions of their fathers because they want to trap him in his Sabbath violation. You see, when they say that and ask him, how did he receive his sights? And he tells them, he put mud on, his, on my eyes and I washed and I see. That's according to the law of the Talmud, even taking mud from the ground was a violation of their law and it was a work on the Sabbath. And so Jesus had expressly violated a prohibition of theirs, a man-made prohibition on the Sabbath day. And rather than glorying in the God who had transformed this man's life and had given him sight, they convict Jesus. They're critical of him for a man-made law and his breaking of it. You see how their, their pride is manifesting. And this is something that can happen often even among Christians where instead of being convicted of their sin when they hear the tr truth proclaimed to them from the pulpit, that they will instead criticize the preacher or they will pick on some aspect of how he has lived rather than looking at the truth of what God does in changing sinners through Christ. They were nitpicking over this small violation of their man-made law rather than in giving worship to the God who had given this man sight. In their arrogance and their pretension, then they endeavor to convict the Lord Jesus rather than to give worship to God. But even among them, there was a division. Some were saying, well, how could this man do this unless he were sent of God? Now, perhaps it was Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees, who was there saying this. But there was a division. And so they asked him, what did he think? And he said, Jesus is a prophet. 400 years had passed of silence. No prophet from God had come. And here it is that he says, and he believes that that period of silence has passed, that a new prophet has come from God, and he is the one who healed my eyes. Well, the Jews didn't believe this man, and in their arrogance and in their pride and their antagonism, then they call in his parents in order to ask them, and hope that perhaps it is that this man was not, in fact, born blind, that his parents at least will admit that this was all a lie, this can't be true. And so they call in the parents, and then in their unbelief, then they try to get them to confess that this is all a lie. But yet the parents in their fear do not, in fact, confess Jesus Christ. And you see that there's a measure of darkness even in their own lives, as not only do they not confess Jesus Christ, uh, they don't say anything negative about him. They try to straggle the middle ground in order to not ultimately stand for Jesus. And then for the second time in verse 24, they call the man who had been blind and they say to him to give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. And they try to extract out of him a confession that would glorify God in heaven but yet reject Jesus Christ. And there are many today who will say that they're religious 
and that they will worship God, but yet they reject Jesus. And this is really the touchstone of the Christian faith. When you talk with someone about who is Jesus, it reveals what they truly believe. So in this passage, then, we see how as they are pridefully attacking this man and trying to extort from him a confession that rejects Jesus, then he, in fact, displays a triumph of faith. And this is really the, the third reaction to Christ, as we've seen that there is first the shock of the neighbors at the changed life and the antagonism of these Pharisees who ultimately cast him out of the synagogue that the third reaction is one of true faith and belief in Christ. We see this man here repeatedly growing in his faith. As first of all, he doesn't even know where Jesus is. And then he goes on to say that this man, in fact, is a prophet sent from God, the one who told me to wash in the pools of scent. And then here, as they challenge him, and they say that they are, in fact, the disciples of Moses, uh, he says that, in fact, he believes that this man came from God because God does not listen to sinners. If this man, Jesus, were not from God, then God would not have listened to him. Never since the beginning of the world had it been heard that a man had been born blind and now could see. And what he's doing here is, in a subtle way, he's pointing out to the Pharisees that this man is, in fact, even greater than, Je than Moses. Even Moses hadn't opened up the eyes of the blind, but yet he had, in fact, seen it happen here firsthand as Jesus opened his eyes. This man responds in faith. As we consider his reaction as one of faith, then you ought to remember how it is that this was all a fulfillment of what the Lord had promised in the Old Testament as one who, in fact, would send a light into the world. Isaiah 29, 18, In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exalt in the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah 35, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Isaiah 60, over and over again, we see more scriptures about the coming of the light. Isaiah 60, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. This man, in faith, is responding, unlike those who were antagonistic to Christ, unlike those who simply were in shock over what had happened, he responds in faith, ultimately, to the one who was the promised light. Jesus Christ, the light of the world. The real question is, which person are you? How is it that you respond to Jesus Christ? When he reveals more of himself to you, the light that illumines your own sin, rebellion against him, do you turn away? Do you respond in pride and antagonism? Or do you respond in faith and believing in him? Do you seek out Jesus Christ as the light? Jesus said then, in the last part of our portion here, as the man then outside of the temple is there by himself. And once again, Jesus finds him. Over and over again, it's Jesus who finds the man. And Jesus here, a man who he had not at that point seen at all with his eyes, asks him, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe, and worshiped him. And this is the response of true faith, to ask and to seek who is Jesus, and then to believe and to worship. And ultimately, this is the reason why Jesus Christ came into the world, 
And Jesus here gives us the whole point of him in this entire passage, in verse 39, when he says that for judgment I came into this world to separate between two groups of people, between those who do not see that he might make them see, those who were lost in the darkness of their own sin and slavery to Satan, that he might deliver them. And then secondly, that those who see may become blind. Speaking of the Pharisees and all those like them who think that they see, but yet in fact are blind. This is why Jesus came into the world as the light of the world, to separate between the only two kinds of people that there are, those who are blind and those who think that they see. And that is the question, who are you? And for those who are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, are you continuing to seek the light? Are you continuing to seek him in order to know more of him? Romans 13, 12 really wraps up the application for us today. Romans 13, 12, where it speaks about what it is that is the privilege of all those who are truly changed. Romans 13, 12. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ to make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So all those whose lives are truly changed, who have come to know the light of Jesus Christ, do not do these things. Number one, we could say anything that distracts you from the battle of the Christian life instead of being trapped in that darkness, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ means that you will, in fact, strip away anything that will hinder you from battling for Jesus Christ, to be with him who was sent by the Father to display God's works in the world. Secondly, not infighting husbands and wives or churches, not showing forth the light of Christ because of their division. We see here Paul in Romans saying that to walk in the daytime means not quarreling or having jealousy. In many practical ways, we see how those who have come to know the light of Jesus Christ are fundamentally changed, and it is only Christ who has the power to do that. The light is not something that comes from you. It's only reflected as you come to know the Lord Jesus, and his light then shines from you so that people will see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. Jesus Christ is the light of the world.